Council meeting for Monday, May 13th, 2019. Please stand and join with us in the Pledge of, uh, Pledge of Allegiance, which will be led by members of, U of VFW Post 1621. Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And as they're receiving a little bit of a token of appreciation, should note that this morning, they, or past Saturday morning, they placed over 200 U.S. flags around the city, which is an amazing feat. So. Thank them very much for that as well. Uh, in case of an emergency, do not use the elevator. Please use the east entrance, go down one floor, uh, exit to the alley, um, walk to the north side of the police department and wait for further instructions. Go to the first floor as opposed to the one immediately below uh, and exit to the police department. With that, roll call. All council members are present. Thank you. Uh, item number three on the agenda is Sustainable Janesville Award Recognitions. Matt. Go ahead. Thank you. Matt Robinson, Environmental Technician. Uh, the Sustainable Janesville Committee created the annual Sustainable Janesville Awards Program in 2011 to highlight excellence in environmental innovation, stewardship, and advocacy in Janesville. The Sustainability Awards meet the mission of the Sustainable Janesville Committee, which works to advocate, foster, and advance the collective efforts of city residents, businesses, and government to educate, endorse policies, and ensure implementation of practices that are both environmentally and economically sustainable. The Sustainable Janesville Committee would like to thank everyone who participated in this year's awards program by nominating a community member, business, or organization to be recognized for their efforts. On behalf of the SJC, I am pleased to present the 2019 Sustainable Janesville Awards to our deserving recipients this evening. Our first award winner is Laura Peterson. Laura is the Education and Volunteer Manager at Rotary Gardens. She was honored with the Sustainable Janesville Award because of her role in recruiting and organizing volunteers to assist with the education programs and the upkeep of the gardens. Laura's dedication, knowledge, and passion have resulted in the inspiration for many volunteers to become lifelong stewards of sustainable gardening practices. The Sustainable Janesville Committee is presenting Laura Peterson with an award tonight in recognition of her leadership in sustainability. Congratulations, Laura. And if you'd come up for a picture. Thank you, and the podium is available if you'd like to say a couple of words. I would like to thank the Sustainability Committee very much for this award. I'm deeply honored and flattered to receive it and very excited to use the principles that I was nominated for to continue to use those in my job and in the community. So thank you very much. Our next award winner is the Janesville Velo Club. The Janesville Velo Club was recognized with the 2019 Sustainable Janesville Award as a result of their tremendous efforts pr to promote cycling in the city. The club organized the successful Janesville Grand Prix bike race and also advocated for the creation of bike lanes as part of the Court Street two-way conversion project. The Sustainable Janesville Committee is presenting the Janesville Velo Club with an award tonight in recognition of their environmental leadership and ad advocacy. Congratulations. Uh, 
well, thank you very much on behalf of the Janesville Velo Club and our 183 members. We appreciate this uh, recognition. And one of the things is, is we don't do it for the recognition. We do it for what we feel is important to quality of life, economic improvement, and physical fitness. And uh, the nice thing is, is timing is everything. I, in 2000, when individuals, in the year 2000, when individuals decided they needed to do something to make bicycling uh, awareness more prevalent here in town, they got together and I'm fortunate to be 19 years later being able to uh, associate with the Bike Advisory Committee for this year having Janesville's first bicycle week. and. It's great that on Saturday, the Family Bike Fest, uh, Wednesday night, the Go Slow Ride, Friday, the Bike to Work Week, and I apologize, Dean and guys, I'm missing one thing, I think, but uh, it's just great because bicycling is good for a community. Bicycling can change the culture of a community, and it's even better when we've got a council that understands designing bike lanes and bike trails, an administration that supports it, and an engineering department that knows how to get it done. So thanks everybody. It's definitely a Janesville project for everything that we do and I just wanna say thank you very much. We appreciate the honor. Next item is consideration and action on a proposed resolution recognizing outgoing citizen board commission and committee members for their loyal and conscientious service to the city of Janesville file resolution 2019-1659. And once we need a motion to approve that, thank you council member Wolf, a second. second. Second by council member Williams. Discussion, all in favor say, raise your right hand. Thank you very much. Motion passes unanimously. Maggie, go ahead with the procedure. Good evening, council members. Maggie Dar, assistant to the city manager. So as uh, council president Gruber stated, tonight's staff is asking you to adopt file resolution number 2019-1659 recognizing outgoing committee members. In total tonight, we're recognizing 24 individuals who cumulatively served the community for 81 years. They put in countless hours towards improving our community and city government, and they did it for free. Um, the clerk treasurer is going to read the resolution, and when, as he calls the names of individuals who are outgoing committee members that are in attendance, which I know there's several of you, I'd ask them to come forward to get a certificate um, and a city coin. And frankly, I wish we could do a lot more to recognize these individuals for all of their efforts, but we're good, prudent stewards of, uh, of tax dollars. Um, so then after you receive your certificate, if you could stay to the side, because we'll take a group photo. And then following this item, we'll ask you to adopt file resolution number 2019-1660. That's recognizing all of the incoming committee members. And for that, the individuals that are in attendance, in attendance as your name is read, if you could just stand, please. Thank you. Go ahead, clerk. File resolution number 2019-1659. A resolution recognizing outgoing citizen board, commission, and committee members for their loyal and conscientious service to the city of Janesville. Whereas members of boards, commissions, and committees provide an invaluable service to our city, advising the city council on a wide variety of subjects by making recommendations on important policy matters, and whereas without the assistance of the various boards, commissions, and committees, the City Council could give many complex and significant matters only a cursory review. And whereas serving on a board, commission, or committee is an excellent way to participate in the functioning of local government and to make a personal contribution to the improvement of our community. And whereas the following individuals served on a city board, commission, or committee with their tenure ending during or at the close of the 2018-2019 term. Alcohol License Advisory Committee, Todd Kimball. Audit Committee, Douglas Thorpe. Community Development Authority, Alan Herbst. <coughs> Downtown Business Improvement District Board, Jim Alverson. Pat McDonald.
Golf Courses Advisory Committee, Bob Barry, Jim Hawkinson, David Manchal Davis, Kenneth Pizzuro, Donald Prestia, Jerry Robuck, Historic Commission, Mark Bobzine, Charles Zen, Library Board of Trustees, Beatriz Aguilar, Sarah Hudz Hudziak, Beth Tallon, Parks and Recreation Advisory Committee, Robert Baker, David Schollmeyer, Police and Fire Commission, Scott Boardwell, Sustainable Janesville Committee, Aaron Agater, Paul Benson, Dean Painter, Zoning Board of Appeals, Lonnie Coppernall, David Jackson. Now therefore be it resolved by the Common Council of the City of Janesville to recognize outgoing citizen board, commission, and committee members for their loyal and conscientious service to the City of Janesville. Thank you very much. Uh, next item is item number five, consideration and action on a proposed resolution recognizing incoming members, citizen members of boards, commissions, and committees for their willingness and capacity to serve the city of Janesville. Uh, with that, we will have the clerk read the names and we'd ask that you would stand if you're here in present tonight. Uh, I'll move you read approval. the resolution after the resolution is read. Okay. Oh, okay. okay. File resolution number 2019-1660. A resolution recognizing incoming citizen board, commission, and committee members for their willingness and capability to serve on the city of Janesville. Whereas members of boards, commissions, and committees provide an invaluable service to our city, advising the city council on a wide variety of subjects by making recommendations on important policy matters. And whereas without the assistance of the various boards, commissions, and committees, the City Council could give many complex and significant matters only a cursory review. And whereas serving on a board, commission, or committee is an excellent way to participate in the functioning of local government and to make a personal contribution to the improvement of our community. And whereas the following individuals were appointed to serve on a City Board, Commission, or Committee throughout the 2018-2019 term or at the beginning of the 2019-2020 term Advisory Committee on Appointments, Katherine Myers, Lorraine Vanderjat, Alcohol License Advisory Committee, Mark Bumpus, Kevin Riley, Audit Committee, Margaret Cohen, Bruce Hamilton, Community Development Authority, Nicole Hayen, Downtown Business Improvement District Board, Jenny Lindstrom, Dave Marshick, David Raymer, Historic Commission, 
Robert Baker, Robert Allen Luckett, Library Board of Trustees, Adam Dines, Julie Janik, Parks and Recreation Advisory Committee, Paul Benson, Kristen Mickelson, Patricia Thornton, Police and Fire Commission, Rhonda Suda, Sustainable Janesville Committee, Susan Johnson, Eileen Newcomer, James Zumstein, Zoning Board of Appeals, Barry Badiger, Jason Brown, Terrence Kendallin. Now therefore be it resolved by the Common Council of the City of Janesville to recognize incoming citizen board, commission, and committee members for their willingness and capability to serve the City of Janesville. Council Member Conley. I move adoption of file resolution number 2019-1660. Is there a second? Second. Second, thank you, Council Member Williams. Anything further? On behalf of the city, thank you so very much for the service that you're about to enter into. You'll find it to be something that I think when you wrap it up years from now, hopefully, uh, something that, that's very satisfactory and satisfying as well. Thank you very much. Next item on the agenda is item number six. Up, oh, We should vote, shouldn't we? Yes, all in favor, raise that hand. I should explain, we're suffering a little technical difficulty up here. Um, the normal electronics that we have to assist us in these things um, went kaput. So we're going back to the old fashioned way and some of us are a little slower to learn than others. So please be patient. <laughs> Next item on the agenda is item six, which is consideration and action on a proposed resolution recognizing the week of May 19, 2019 as a National Public Works Week, file resolution 2019-1655. Resolution number 2019-1655, a resolution recognizing the week of May 19 through 25, 2019 as National Public Works Week in the city of Janesville. Whereas public works projects, facilities, and infrastructure are vital to the city's continued growth and economic success, supporting job creation and promoting development in transportation, education, public safety, and other sectors that are essential to building livable neighborhoods and communities, and whereas the city's dedicated public works professionals are responsible for planning, designing, building, and operating public works facilities and services, including transportation, parks, water treatment and supply, solid waste systems, and other essential activities that are critical to residents and visitors of this city. And whereas the health, safety, and comfort of the community greatly depends on these facilities and services, and whereas the quality and effectiveness of these facilities are vitally dependent upon the efforts and skill of public works officials, and whereas the efficiency of the qualified and dedicated personnel who staff public works departments is materially influenced by the people's attitude and understanding of the importance of the work they perform, now therefore be it resolved by the Common Council of the City of Janesville that on this 13th day of May, 2019, do hereby proclaim that May 19 through May 25, 2019, National Public Works Week, and hereby call upon all citizens and civic organizations to join the city in conjunction with the American Public Works Association in activities and ceremonies designed to recognize the contributions which public works employees make every day to our health, safety, comfort, and quality of life. What's the pleasure of the council? I'll move approval of file resolution number 2019-1655. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Okay. Second by council member Markline. All those in favor, raise your right hand. Motion carries unanimously. Paul Woodard, Director of Public Works, is here to receive the resolution. And council member Conley is going to be presenting it. <clears throat> Uh, good evening, Paul Woodard, Director of Public Works. On behalf of the entire Public, public Works Department, over 140 people strong, we appreciate the Council's recognition of Public Works Week. Uh, we are the department that people don't always know about until the water doesn't drain or work in the morning and turn on their sink, can't get through on the street, or garbage isn't picked up. 
fortunate in our community, those are events that are a rare occurrence due to the great team we have in Public Works and also more importantly, the support we have from the council in maintaining our city infrastructure. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. And stick around, we want to do a picture. We already did it. <laughs> Another one. Next item is item seven, consideration and action on a proposed resolution recognizing the week of May 12, 2019 as National Police Week and the day of May 15, 2019 as Peace Officer Memorial Day, file resolution number 2019-1653. Resolution number 2019-1653, a resolution recognizing the week of May 12th as National Police Week and the day of May 15th as Peace Officers Memorial Day. Whereas the Congress of the United States of America has designated the week of May 12th to be dedicated as National Police Week and the day of May 15th each year to be Peace Officers Memorial Day. And whereas law enforcement officers are our guardians of life and property defenders of the individual right to be free and dedicated to the per preservation of life, liberty, and justice, and whereas it is important that all citizens know and understand the duties, responsibility, responsibilities, hazards, and sacrifices of their law enforcement agency, and that members of our law enforcement agency recognize their duty to serve the people by safeguarding life and property, by protecting them against violence and disorder, and by protecting the innocent against deception and the weak against oppression. And whereas the Janesville City Council desires to honor the valor, service, and dedication of the police officers that serve the city of Janesville. Now therefore be it resolved by the Common Council of the City of Janesville on this 13th day of May, 2019, that the week of May 12th to May 18th be observed as Police Week and call upon all citizens to especially honor and show our appreciation for the police officers of the city of Janesville by deed, remark, and attitude. And be it further resolved by the Common Council that the day of May 15th be proclaimed to be Peace Officers Memorial Day and that flags be flown at half staff on this day in honor of those men and women who have lost their lives in the performance of their duties while protecting their fellow citizens and communities. Thank you. Councilmember Williams. Make a motion that we adopt file resolution number 2019 1653. Second by Council Member Wolf. Uh, all in favor signify, raise your right hand. Motion carries unanimously. Detective Dennis LeCaptain is here to receive the resolution and hopefully he'll <coughs> say a few words. It's my honor to be here this evening to represent the men and women in law enforcement that I work with every day. I especially want to thank the council for joining my brothers and sisters in remembering and honoring the officers, particularly last year in the state of Wisconsin, three of which um, were killed in the line of duty. And it's during this week, National Police Week, that those officers and many across the country are remembered and honored. Thank you. Item of business is item number eight, consideration and action on a proposed resolution recognizing the week of May 19, 2019 as Emergency Medical Services Week, file resolution number 2019-1650. Resolution number 2019-1650, a resolution recognizing the week of May 19th through the 25th, 2019 as Emergency Medical Services Week in the city of Janesville. Whereas emergency medical services is a vital public service, and whereas the members of City of Janesville Fire Department provide advanced life support emergency medical services care to those in need 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and whereas the access to quality emergency care dramatically improves the survival and recovery rates of those who experience sudden illness or injury, and whereas the Janesville Fire Department has the third highest save rate for cardiac arrest in the nation. And whereas the emergency medical technicians and paramedics are the first responders of the emergency medical services system. 
and whereas the members of emergency medical services teams engage in thousands of hours of specialized training and continuing education to enhance their life-saving skills, and whereas it is appropriate to recognize the value and the accomplishments of emergency medical services providers in the city of Janesville by designating Emergency Medical Services Week. Now therefore be it resolved by the Common Council of the City of Janesville on this 13th day of May 2019 that the week of May 19th to May 25th be observed as Emergency Medical Services Week and call upon all Janesville citizens to especially honor and show our appreciation for the City of Janesville Fire Department EMTs and paramedics by deed, remark, and attitude. I am going to move approval of file resolution number 2019-1650. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Let's go ahead and vote. All in favor? Oh, I was just going to. Go ahead, One thing I uh, don't know if uh, anybody else uh, want to make sure that you didn't miss this. The, was the Janesville Fire Department has the third highest save rate for cardiac arrest in the nation. In the nation. Um, and as one person who has used that service, I'm grateful. So thank you. Thank you. Let's go ahead and vote on the resolution. All in favor. And the resolution passes unanimously. If uh, the crew from station number one wants to come up, we'll do a presentation and a picture or two. On behalf of the fire department, my name is Josh Ecker, um, Lieutenant, and I want to thank you for this, this recognition. It means a lot, as has been mentioned already tonight. We don't do this for recognition. We don't do this for praise. We all signed up to do this as a job, as a career, and we enjoy helping people and making a difference <laughs> in sometimes their worst day. As you mentioned, we're th third in the nation for cardiac saves, and our goal is always to get better. And thank you to the council for your backing, for your support. We're constantly increasing our training. We're constantly asking for more money for training, for equipment, for our apparatus and stations. And it's all for the community, for the taxpayer. Um, I want to thank you, say thank you to the citizens for your undying support. And um, this is for you. It's what you deserve. It's what you pay for. And we are thrilled that once in a while we're able to make a difference to you understanding that you pay taxes every year and you may not be calling us every year but in the, those opportunities we have to make a difference thank you very much and thank you for your support thank you next item is item number nine consideration and action on a proposed resolution pro proclaiming may 11th through the 18th as Bike to Work Week and May 17, 2019 as Bike to Work Day in the city of Janesville. File resolution 2019-1643. Resolution number 2019-1643. A resolution proclaiming May 11 through 18, 2019 as Bike to Work Week and May 17, 2019 as Bike to Work Day in the city of Janesville. Whereas May is recognized nationwide as Bike Month, and whereas cycling benefits health, fitness, outdoor exercise, enjoyment of nature, stress reduction, and peace of mind, and whereas cycling benefits cyclists and non-cyclists because it is a clean, non-intrusive, low-cost, congestion-free, and pollution-free means of transportation, and whereas creating a bicycle-friendly community is an important goal of the city of Janesville in pursuit of improved personal health, 
reduced health care costs as a result of lower rates of chronic conditions through active living, reduced traffic congestion in urban areas, a cleaner environment, and increased tourism opportunities across the city. And whereas the city of Janesville and its partners in Arise are working diligently on downtown revitalization, creating public spaces and encouraging tourism and a vital commercial ethos attracting young professionals to live and work in Janesville. And whereas local bike organizations, the Janesville Velo Club <coughs> and the Rock Trail Coalition, along with the Bike Friendly Janesville Committee, seek to encourage increased biking to work and to school. Now therefore be it resolved that the City <coughs> of Janesville Council hereby proclaims the week of May 11 through May 18, 2019 as Bike to Work Week and Friday, May 17, 2019 as Bike to Work Day in the City of Janesville. Be it further resolved that the Janesville City Council reminds citizens to share the road safely with bicyclists. Thank you. What's the pleasure of the council? Council Member Parkland. Make a motion to adopt by resolution number 2019-1643, proclaiming May 11th through the 18th, 2019 as Bike to Work Week and May 17th, 2019 as Bike to Work Day in the city of Janesville. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Council Member Benson seconds it. Any further comments? Hearing none, in favor, raise your right hand. And the motion passes unanimously. Dean Painter is here from the Bike Friendly community uh, committee to attend and uh, receive the resolution. Fifteen. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, just very much. Thank you very much for the resolution. Um, even though I've been retired for ten years, I rode my bike downtown today in solidarity with our cycling brotherhood. Um, Wednesday is the Go Slow Ride, which begins at the Festival Street, 6 p.m. That's for all the slower people like myself. Um, <laughs> on Friday, from 7 to 9 a.m. Yeah, we recognize Bike to Work Day. Again, at the festival grounds, we'll have coffee and treats down there. And then Saturday, the 18th, is the first Bike to the Farmer's Market. There will be four or five of those this summer. So thank you very much. Thank you. And we're going to move item number 15 from the consent agenda up forward to be the next item. And that's a resolution, a consideration and action on a proposed resolution proclaiming May 2019 as Asian Pacific American Heritage Month in the city of Janesville. File resolution number 2016-1646. Would the clerk please read? File resolution number 2019-1646. A resolution proclaiming May 2019 as Asian Pacific American Heritage Month in the city of Janesville. Whereas Asian and Pacific Islander Americans have made many contributions to the history of the United States that include, but are not limited to, serving honorably in the armed forces, fighting for the United States in foreign wars, and advocating for civil rights, and whereas Asian and Pacific Islander Americans have endured hardships, including unjust working conditions, prejudice, and discrimination in some of the darkest times in our nation's history, including the Chinese Exclusion Act, naturalized citizenship ineligibility, the alien land law, anti-miscegenation laws, and Japanese internment. And whereas the Cambodian and Lao refugees who first came to Janesville in the late 1970s and early 1980s sought to escape genocide in their homeland or to seek protection after working for the United States government during the Vietnam War. And whereas Janesville's history and character is shaped by the churches and residents who sponsored Cambodian and Lao refugees, supporting them in their becoming integral members of the Janesville community. And whereas the Asian American and Pacific Islander community is a fast growing diverse population comprised of more than 45 distinct ethnicities and more than 100 language dialects. And whereas Asian and Pacific Islander Americans continue to cultivate, advance, 
and lead in the fields of art, fashion, business, technology, education, science, government, law, humanities, medicine, sports, and entertainment. Now therefore be it resolved that the Common Council of the City of Janesville recognizes May 2019 as Asian Pacific American Heritage Month for the purpose of encouraging residents of this city to increase their knowledge about the history, achievements, and contributions made by Asian and Pacific Islander Americans throughout our nation and the state of Wisconsin. The pleasure of the council. Move to adopt resolution number 2019-1646. Second. Motion by William, second by Conley to approve the item. What's, uh, all those in favor, raise your hand. Motion carries unanimously. I believe we have someone here to accept the resolution. Please come forward. And when you do get to the microphone, introduce yourselves, please. Hello, um, I'm Emily Wright. I'm a senior at Craig High School, and I just want to say thank you for this resolution. It's super cool. Um, it kind of hits home for me because I'm a Korean American, and I've been taking Chinese for 10 plus years, and I just really like the whole idea of learning more about each other and bringing the community together. Thank you. Thank you, and that brings us back to item number 10, which is public comments on items on the agenda not requiring a public hearing and on matters which can be affected by council action. Speakers are limited to four minutes to make their comments and the Wisconsin Open Meetings Law limits the City Council's ability to respond to speakers. Would the clerk read the speakers' names? Ty Bolarud. Ted Ballard, 419 South Walnut Street, <coughs> James, Wisconsin. Um, you know, the, it's kind of funny. Parenda, Pananda bread, I can't say it. They got a, an alternative as part of the record. We're guaranteed cancer. Here's food preservatives. They're all gas derivatives. I'll show you guys a copy. They don't put gas per, uh, uh, derivatives in their food. Um, also, I wanted to you point out uh, the public interest requires. Public interest requires only constitution. Public interest only requires a vote from uh, city council or any other sworn officer of constitutional rights. That's not something that we provide in the city of Janesville in our secret uh, code courts. Um, uh, to the contrary, I'm trying to uh, um, encourage uh, uh, building development by actually uh, taking uh, and figuring the services on the other side of the street, on, on the homeowner side of the street, like $10,000, $12,000 is the number I come up with, at $12,500 per service, and anybody that was building would, would gladly pay that to plug in. Um, that's 50,000, and 50,000 times the 25,000 plus homes we'd have is $1.25 million. Now, yeah, for taxable in income, you wouldn't want that number. But if you wanted to develop, if you wanted to do developments and bring a pipeline like sewers, uh, sewer pipeline, you would want your planning committee to have that number. Right now, the number is $12 million compared to $1.25 million, and that's at $50,000 a house. You know, there's a long difference between $12 million and $1.25 million. And that's where your development companies are, at $12 million. Um, up under the Constitution, uh, uh, Wisconsin Constitution, pro uh, property taken by municipals. No municipal cor corporation shall take private property for public use against the consent of the owner without the necessary thereof being established in the matter prescribed by law. Well, the district court already said they couldn't find 
where it was prescribed in law in my case. The only case that the city has ever taken on taking private property taken. And even if you can take private property, you have to pay just compensation because them are two completely different things. And right now, you can have secret uh, uh, get-togethers, and, 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 and but basically, it's to cover up for public nuisancing, okay? Uh, uh, to cover up all the other uh, uh, rights that are taken from the not, um, uh, um, uh, how do you say that, not professional people or uh, uh, certain people that are picked on. Okay, there's all sorts of people that, that are picked on, and we do very little about that. We, uh, we offer uh, a, a lot of suggestions, um, but none of them come to a place where people can actually find safe haven, I guess, in, in the sense that they can come and ask somebody else because basically they don't want to testify against you. Uh, the planning, in my opinion, the planning commission doesn't have public comments other than uh, um, to annex land we have uh, 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 a public hearing when it comes to annex, annexing land in the Planning con Commission, but we have no public comments. So we, are we really interested in what the public thinks? I gotta ask you, are we interested in what the public thinks when we can't have public comments? Okay, so it's not that hard to find. And also the development, if you look up under article, I'm sorry, if you look up under, Thank you, Ty. If you'd like to file the balance of your remarks, we'd be more 11. than happy to accept them. Constitution Thank you. 11. You Thank can you, find Ty. how to make that Thank work you. for you. Mark Fuller. Good evening. Uh, three, uh, Mark Fuller, 320 East Holmes Street. Uh, thank you for listening to me. Um, and thank you for your service to the city. I wanted to speak uh, in favor of the proposed revision of the public parking ordinance uh, for the Palmer Park um, situation so that people could sleep overnight um, there uh, on a trial basis. Uh, when we think that last year the estimated number of homeless in Rock County was uh, over 300 and the Section 8 housing wait lists are either non-existent, I mean closed, or there's a one to two year wait. Um, these are just some of the obstacles that our less fortunate neighbors have to face. And so if we remove any obstacle, I think that's a plus. And um, this, this proposal is easy to implement. Uh, it's easy to alter. Uh, the fact that the Janesville Police Department was involved in some of the um, site seeking and uh, considerations of it says to me that's uh, somewhat of an endorsement, and it gives me um, comfort. And then um, this could be a springboard for further creative work in helping the homeless transition back into active partic participation in our community. So uh, I would urge you to uh, consider voting in favor of this when it comes up next month or the end of this month. Thank you. Thank you. Jessica Locker. Hi, my name is Jessica Loker, and I reside at 3421 Tennyson Drive. I'm the Associate Director at ECHO and the Public Relations Chair for the Homeless Intervention Task Force. I am a member of the FOCUS group and participated in the subcommittee that researched the parking lot for the homeless. The group met multiple times, discussed um, pros and cons. We also received feedback from homeless participants and agencies who assist the homeless. We need this ordinance changed because there are currently over 350 homeless people in Rock County. And House of Mercy's average wait list in 2018 included 35 homeless people in their cars each month. There is not enough shelter beds, enough motel voucher money, or affordable housing to assist our current homeless population. I understand that this solution is a short-term fix and is not ideal, but it is a starting point for us to provide a safe, secure place for our families and individuals who are homeless with a vehicle. Agencies will be able to outreach to them and make referrals to services that can get them housing, which they may not otherwise be eligible for. This will also assist agencies as we track the needs, um, which will assist us in getting more funding to provide services to our homeless population. 
Another HITF member stated, this isn't a long-term solution to homelessness, but that shouldn't prevent our community from taking steps to address the issues in other ways that, or other ways in the present. And this is a cost-effective short-term measure that can offer families and any of our homeless a greater safety until funding or other incentives can be put in place to address the issues at another level. HITF, ECHO, and I support this ordinance change and welcome any questions that you have about this, um, and we'll be seeing you later this month. Thank you. Thank you. Nancy Dries. Okay, sure. On here on drive? Yes, indeed. I'm sorry, I thought that was just a sign in sheet. Oh, well, you don't have to speak if you don't want to. <laughs> okay, I'm actually here on sort of a fact finding mission. I was not aware of the initiative to bring. Could you state your name and address, please? Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, thank you. Nancy Marie Dries. I live at 1117 North Huron Drive here in Janesville, longtime resident of the city. Um, I came here to find out more about the initiative to allow homeless to park in Palmer Park. Um, I'm not sure what I think of it. I'd like to know more before I have an opinion that I'm willing to state. It, it is kind of a surprise to me, and I do have some concerns in terms of like the effect it might have on the community, children that are in the area using the facilities. But I'm open-minded, so I'm willing to hear. But I think we do need to hear. I think more need, information needs to be provided through a public discussion. Um, I have the sense that there's been a lot of discussion, perhaps in smaller groups. And I, I apologize, I didn't know much about it until I was made aware of it. But I think I may speak for other people in saying we'd like to know more. And I think as taxpayers and members of the community, I think we are certainly we have that right. We have the right to know more before decisions are made. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Ed Pulliam. Good evening, my name is Ed Pulliam, 313 South Harmony Drive in Janesville. Um, by way of introduction, I sat for six years up on that stage that you have there, but the desk wasn't near as pretty. <laughs> uh, I've also served on the Plan Commission and the Community Development Authority. And in all of those capacities, I've heard many times, not in my backyard, I live in the last, the southernmost block of Harmony Drive before it turns into Palmer Park. So I guess you could say that the proposal for the uh, overnight homeless parking is in my backyard. Frankly, I don't like the all in my backyard, uh, not in my backyard argument. I think that the proposal has been extremely well thought out by city staff with the uh, police department's input. Um, I think that 500 and some square, or 500 and some feet away from the nearest residential property uh, makes it somewhat of a non-issue, but uh, I suppose if my house was in that 500 uh, foot area, maybe I'd think a little different, but I'd keep my mouth shut before the council. Um, we need this. As a volunteer uh, for a homeless shelter here in town, I see every time I go into the shelter, the need. and. This shelter has a waiting list. Most shelters have a waiting list. We need something short term, and this would do it. And I urge you to not be swayed by the not in my backyard argument. 
but to look at the good that this proposal could do. And I thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Pulliam. Paul Gerheis. My name is Paul Dries. I live in Janesville at 2404 Lombard Avenue. I'd just like to express my opposition to this uh, change in origins, ordinance to allow uh, overnight parking in the park. I feel that we, the city has spent a lot of money on parks already to make them a desirable place to walk, uh, for children to play in some of the play areas. We've uh, made a lot of effort to make these parks very desirable to all of the citizenry. I feel that this is a bit of a misuse of the parks. Um, I think there should be other solutions other than taking parks that we have um, put a lot of pride in. We pride ourselves in Wisconsin's Park Place. I think a little more thought should go into um, utilizing this space uh, in the ways that it was meant to be as opposed to um, putting in um, homeless people. I think uh, the increase in crime and the lack of uh, reduced safety will uh, cause a lot of people not to use these parks in the, in, in the way that they were intended for. That's what I'd like to express. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Trees. Andrews? <laughs> Don't want to, okay. Jeannie uh, Carfora? Hi, my name is Jean Carfora. Uh, I live at 531 Greendale Avenue. Um, I don't like speaking in public, so I appreciate uh, your patience and your understanding. Um, my husband and I live on the east side on Greendale Avenue, um, and we've enjoyed the walking trail. Um, I feel very safe in that neighborhood because of our police. Um, but I understand that the, uh, this um, provision or resolution that you're considering um, is from 10 o'clock at night to 6 o'clock in the morning. And so that um, removes a lot of, of possible danger or fear for um, any families who might be enjoying the park at different, different times during the day. Um, I respect and reiterate what ECHO and the YWCA have said as far as this uh, short-term possibility. I'm, I see Janesville as a very caring community. You mentioned earlier the character of our community. Um, and I see the results through the gifts shelter, um, the House of Mercy 1649, that we are a very caring, very caring community. Um, and this is because of your support. Um, my question specifically would be, how many homeless are we talking about? Jessica mentioned uh, an unfortunate number. Uh, safety issues addressed not, for, not just for uh, neighbors, but also for the homeless that would be living in the cars during this particular time. Um, we have friends who have looked into rental uh, apartments um, that are available in Janesville. And you know as well as I do that um, there's a shortage there. And if there's not, uh, you know, you also have to um, include the cost issues too. If you're talking about a homeless person, there's no possibility for them to be able to, um, to afford housing in Janesville at this time. Um, are we responsible for each other? I've heard too many stories. And I hope each one of you have heard from people who are working hard but struggling and have had a crisis in their life for one reason or another. So I ask that you be open to those, those stories. Think about it from your own perspective 
and how things can turn around so fast. We can talk about possible reality. We can talk about the fear. But I'm asking you to take a chance to work with the community, to work with people who would be, um, who this would be such an advantage for. It is what it is. We've talked about the numbers. Now we need to do, we need to work together with people who are caught in this difficult situation. So um, I'm excited about this possibility, but also knowing that community action, ECHO, House of Mercy, there are so many different organizations that will be working together to provide um, programs and resources for, um, for our neighbors in need right now. So thank you. Thank you. Deb Griffith. Good evening. I thought I was signing in because I, this is probably maybe only my second um, Could you city state council your name, meeting please? ever. Name and address. Uh, Deborah Griffith, 1236 Somerset Court. So as long as I signed in to speak, I purposely came to this meeting because of the uh, possible city ordinance change. And I had some thoughts that I'd already written down, but I didn't realize I was going to be talking to you about it, but I think I will. And I just have a couple um, um, thoughts about it or what I had been thinking about. But um, as I heard the others speak in favor of this, possibility, this opportunity for something that already exists here. I retired from the Janesville School District, and I know for a fact during my time working there at, in the elementary school, particularly there were times that we had families that we knew had no homes and they were living out of their cars. We knew that. We were trying to support that. And so when I heard about this idea and then I thought about the park, I thought that is a perfect place because the houses aren't too close, but the facilities are there. They have always been there. There's uh, lights, electricity, there's bathroom, there's water, and it's always been open 365 days a year. So it isn't like we're adding something, I don't know, to the budget or whatever, because it's always been available. And this is a reality, and they're already trying to sleep wherever they're sleeping, and this puts them in one place where we can recognize this and provide a safe place for them and probably provide them with uh, the resources and things they need. So I'm thinking please vote in favor. I think this is... Uh, problem that we need to realize is here and let's see what we can do to try to help it. Thank you. Thank you. Gary Griffith. Well, you signed in with me because we came to the <laughs> <laughs> Stephanie Adiger. Hi, I'm Stephanie Egeter, 526 Laurel Avenue. And I just wanted to say thank you for considering the ordinance change and for seeking options for the homeless people in our community. I have participated in the point in time homeless count on several occasions now. I forget how many years I've been doing it, but I, uh, I just keep coming back to do it again and again. And I've met a number of people who were sleeping in their cars for various reasons and people who were sleeping in restaurants or not really able to sleep because they didn't have a safe space. And uh, I don't know how much you know about that homeless count, but people have to answer questions on a survey in order to be counted. And I'm just constantly amazed by the brave people who share their stories with us and very touched. And 
we've often been able to help people, but there have also been many times that stick with me in my heart where we can't help. There isn't a solution. There isn't, there isn't room for a hotel room for the night. There isn't an option for people. And, uh, and they're really great people. I mean, veterans and families and people with disabilities who just are down on their luck. Um, I, I've never had a bad experience going up and introducing myself and asking survey questions and interacting with people who are sleeping in their vehicles and knock on wood here. But um, I, I really think that uh, they're needing our help and needing some more options. So thank you. Thank you very much. That was the last person. Thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda is the city manager's update. Good evening, council members, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, a couple updates for everybody. Uh, first of all, uh, if you have not heard, uh, our uh, town square, specifically the west side of that uh, project, um, has received an award from the American Public Works Association, Wisconsin chapter, as the Project of the Year Award. Uh, so that's great news for our Public Works Department who coordinated the project. Uh, certainly great news for our downtown and great news for our city at large. Um, what I do like about it is we can now refer to the town square as the award-winning town square. So good news for the community. Uh, second thing is, is uh, uh, listed on there is grant funding for bus replacements. Um, if you've paid attention to, uh, to city updates here over the last six months, you'll recognize that the city has received uh, grant funding to replace 14 of our 17 buses. Um, but because of the, uh, the frugalness, if you will, of our uh, JTS uh, bus uh, system director, uh, Becca Smith, my, she and her team have been very, very thrifty in trying to figure out how we build these buses and maximize those grant dollars. And because they were frugal and they maximized those grant dollars, they actually found enough savings um, in those grant fundings to allow for the purchase of another bus um, by, uh, by those grant fundings. And that's a $500,000 find, if you will, in grant funding. Uh, so that's a great news story uh, that we now have 15 buses out of 17 uh, that are inbound um, over the next uh, year to two years. Uh, lead time on a bus order is generally about a year to 18 months. So a great news story. We appreciate the work of JTS um, and certainly the council in approving those grant requests. So good news for the community. Uh, next thing, and I'm out of time, there, Clerk <laughs> Treasurer. Uh, next thing is, is one of the things the city has done over the last uh, uh, six years, I guess, um, is we've participated with uh, the University of Wisconsin at Whitewater for Make a Difference Day, and that's a great project at the end of April where we uh, bring students from UW-Whitewater uh, to the community, uh, and then we partner up with a whole bunch of uh, community partners uh, to make a difference in Janesville. And so this year we had projects at Rotary Gardens, we had projects at Jeffers Park, we had projects uh, here in the downtown, and we had projects um, out at Riverside Park. And so we want just to recognize um, the relationship that we have with the University of Wisconsin at Whitewater, and certainly all of our um, community partners that are listed down there. And I'm gonna read them just uh, for uh, the impact, if you will, but Downtown Janesville Incorporated, the Friends of Riverside Park, the Ice Age Trail Alliance, Rock County Chapter, the Rock Trail Coalition, Rotary Botanical Gardens, and of course, University of Wisconsin uh, Whitewater. And so great news story for the community and um, hope that we can continue to move that uh, um, effort forward in the coming years. Uh, Next on the web, just an update at our city website slash recreation. Um, if you want to register for a, uh, a summer program, now's the time to go online and, uh, and sign up. We have programs for uh, youth and adults, um, certainly uh, aquatics programs throughout the summer, um, and we always have senior programs out there, but we encourage you to visit the city of Janesville's recreation website um, or give them a call at 755-3030 uh, to get uh, registered for those programs. Great uh, community um, effort and, uh, and one of the assets, if you will, of Wisconsin's Park Place. So upcoming events, um, as discussed earlier, May 11th through the 18th is the Bike to Work Week. Um, and so if you're looking for information on Bike to Work Week uh, activities, please uh, check them out on Facebook for all the events throughout the week. 
May 15th, as discussed previously, is Law Enforcement Memorial Ceremony. That's hosted by the Rock County Sheriff's Office this year. It'll be at the Roth Pavilion in Lower Courthouse Park beginning at 6 p.m. Um, hope the community comes out to support that effort. Uh, May 18th is uh, Downtown Janesville Incorporated. Um, their spring wine walk in the downtown um, from noon to 5 p.m. It's turned into quite the event. Um, very, very well attended uh, and a great uh, opportunity to enjoy, uh, hopefully some nice weather, but certainly our um, ever improving downtown. Uh, May 23rd, Arise Now has a community connection talk. They're gonna be doing that at JPAC, where it's an update on all things Arise um, uh, in our, specifically in our downtown, that goes from five to 7 p.m. If you've heard Arise and you don't know the difference between Arise and Arise Now and what's going on in the downtown, I encourage you to come sit in. It's two hours, well spent. There's Q and A opportunity, um, just a great event to uh, showcase what's going on in the downtown. Um, as a reminder, May 27th is Memorial Day. Most city, city facilities um, are closed. We do have a um, parade in our downtown um, from uh, beginning at 10 o'clock. It finishes up over at uh, Traxler Park at about noon. Um, and then there's a ceremony to honor um, our fallen military members uh, in, uh, um, in Traxler Park uh, at the Veterans Plaza. Uh, May 31st is a family empowerment fair. It's down at the Rock County Job Fair from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. June 1st is JPD's Bike Rodeo at Wilson Elementary School from 10 a.m. to noon. Always a very positive event. Um, June 1st is also Take a Kid Fishing Derby at Traxler Park Lagoon beginning at 9 a.m. And as a reminder, June 4th through August 27th is Music at the Marv every Tuesday evening at the Roth Pavilion in Lower Courthouse Park. There are food vendors that will be available. Um, it's open at 5.30 p.m. and music starts at 6.30 p.m. So we encourage you to come out on Tuesday evenings and enjoy that great piece of uh, the city of Janesville and our downtown um, group. Um, as always, there's lots of information out there about what goes on in the city of Janesville. Um, this month on our award-winning Park Place Views uh, TV program, uh, we've got uh, Fire Chief Rhodes uh, talking about fire department and the activities of the fire department. There's also a tour of the Central Fire Station, um, some uh, demos on special team equipment, and you get a chance to meet some of our J JFD personnel. So you can see that um, one-hour program on uh, JATV, Charter Channel 994, or on their YouTube channel. If you're interested in receiving information pushes from the city, and we push out press releases, we put out, push out emergency notifications, um, and any uh, critical updates, we'll do that um, and push that to you. So if you give us your email, uh, email address, we will uh, uh, put you on our list. And so you can go to our city website slash email lists and sign up. You can always call us at the city of Janesville, 755-3000, or my office at 755-3177. You can like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, receive emergency updates from the JPD on Nixle. Um, we now have a City of Janesville LinkedIn site, so if you wanna go to the LinkedIn page for the City of Janesville and learn about city um, updates, but specifically job announcements and business activities, you can do that. If you scan the QR code, uh, you can uh, go to that email sign, us, sign up list, and I always encourage you to please visit the City of Janesville's website. Lots of great information there. Pending any questions, that's all I have this evening. Questions for the City Manager? Hearing none, thank you, Mark. The next several items, items 12 through 20, are consent agenda items, uh, and they'll be taken action together, approved, unless some council member would choose to act on them separately. I'll read them, and then we'll uh, see what stays. Item number 12, city council meeting minutes from the following dates, the regular meeting of April 22nd, 2019, the closed session of April 22nd, 2019 for approval only, not release. The special meeting of May 1st, 2019 and the special meeting of May 3rd, 2019. Item number 13, licenses and recommendations. Uh, item number 14, consideration and action on a proposed resolution in commendation of Brian C. Foster for his more than 26 years of service to the city of Janesville, file resolution 2019-1654. Item number 16, consideration and action on a proposed resolution authorizing the sale of property located at 1116 Oakland Avenue. File resolution 2019-1649. Item number 17, consideration and action to repeal county uh, council policy statement number 15, use of council study committees. 
Uh, item number 18, consideration and action on a developer's memorandum of understanding agreement to extend public infrastructure for Emerald States, a state's third edition. Item number 19, consideration and action on a proposed resolution approving the final plat of Emerald Estates third edition, file resolution 2019-1652. And item number 20, consideration and action to confirm the council president's council member committee assignments. And that is by resolution. Council member Williams. Um, I don't need to really pull for the vote. I just wanted to make a comment on item number 16. Um, is that acceptable? Sure. Uh, I, this is the sale of the property at um, 1116 Oakland Avenue, and I just wanted to make sure that the public was aware of that we um, got this property under uh, tax foreclosure, and we're selling it, and the city is returning uh, a net profit of, or net of uh, $63,000, which will go back into the fund for future projects. And uh, I just uh, thought that that should be noted that that was uh, um, going back into our, the funds going back in and we uh, got $63,000 out of it. A lot of times we barely make money or lose money on it. So I always think when it's something of uh, good news, we should get that out there too. Um, the other item, item number 17, I would like to pull from the consent agenda. Okay, thank you. Council Member Connolly. Yeah, I would like to pull item 12C minutes from the May 1st meeting. Thank you. Any other items to be pulled for di separate discussion? Hearing none, the balance of the items are uh, approved. Let's go to item number 12C, special meeting minutes of May 1st, 2019. Thank you. I just want to correct the omission that by consensus, the council did agree that any applicant who had received three votes would be interviewed on May 3rd. Okay. Any objection? Let the record show that the agenda or the minutes have been approved with that change. Item number 17. My technology is letting me down. Okay. Item number 17, consideration and action and council policy number 15. Yeah, um, I guess I'm having a hard time uh, seeing why um, this one should be uh, removed. I, I don't see a problem with it staying on the books. Um, and I guess I, I would be in favor of uh, this policy staying in the way that it is. So I guess. I, Motion to that I'll make a motion that we uh, um, retain. retain the uh, council policy number 15. Motion to retain council policy number 15. Is there a second? Is there a second? Is there a second? Hearing none, the motion fails. Council member Wolf. I move we repeal council policy statement number 15. Council member Wolf moves to repeal. Is there a second? Second. I second. Second by Mark Lyon. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, raise your right hand. Motion is approved uh, to repeal unanimous by one, one six minutes, six to one. Thank you. That brings us to Item number 21, which is a revaluation update presentation by the city assessor. Good evening and thank you, Council President Gruber and Council Members. Tonight I'll be presenting information in regards to the 2019 citywide revaluation and give you an update of where we are at with that process. As I showed you, or maybe this isn't going to work. Is it on? There we go. Add to our technical difficulties, I guess. 
So, the, as I stated back in August when I talked to you back in 2018, the goal of a revaluation is to bring all properties to 100% of fair market value. The purpose of a revaluation is to proportionately distribute the tax burden based on fair, those fair market values, and the outcome of that is to get equity within our assessments. So our assessments are up in the city of Janesville, and there's many reasons, and some of those have already been stated here this evening tonight. So, and they've been reported by many different member or many different sources of information. So the first one is we've added since 2011, almost 11,000 new jobs in the community of Rock County. It's, and that's per the US Bureau of Labor Statistics. We've had low unemployment rates that have hovered around 3% the last year. And tourism spending has been up for eight years in Janesville. And that's per the Wisconsin Department of Tourism. We also in Janesville Beloit area have been ranked 12th in the nation by Realtor.com as one of the hottest real estate markets in 2018. And the Wisconsin Realtors, Realtors Association has stated that the tight supply of housing in the, in the Janesville area has moved to the consistent upward prices that we've seen. So that is also shown by this graph. You can see the red line represents our assessments have stayed, our average assessed value has stayed at 122.2 since the last revaluation in 2011. And then the market kind of went down and up since then, but still hovering around that average assessment. But since 2016, the market has substantially increased and we have seen the values go from 122.2 up to almost 150,000 for that same average assessed home. I'm gonna go back a couple slides here and I apologize I didn't get these in the right order. So every year, every community needs to report to the Wisconsin Department of Revenue their values. And the city of Janesville has shown that we have grown twice as fast as our peer communities over the past three years. The top line there shows Janesville at 23.1%. The state average growth has been 12% and the peer average growth has been 11.3%. So I think that speaks volumes for the community and just another factor that supports why we have our values going up in the city of Janesville. Move back forward here. So our anticipated average assessment change will be somewhere between 26 and 31%. That is a substantial change for the members of the community. And I want to reiterate that revaluations in themselves are revenue neutral. That 26 to 31% increase is just the average change and that's not a one-to-one -one correlation in what you will see in your taxes going up at the end of this year in December. So the average change is, say our average change is 30%. When you receive your tax bill, you're gonna want to calculate your individual change. From there, the properties that did change, the average change will pay about the same in property tax. The property owners who have moved higher than the average change should expect to pay more. And the property owners that decrease below that average change should expect to pay less in property taxes than they did the prior year. And assessments only determine each property owner's share of the total tax levy to be paid. Can I go ahead two slides there? No. So once we have our notices of assessment change released to the community, which is anticipated to be shortly, you, we will have a tool on our website that's an estimated tax calculator. That tax calculator, they'll be able to plug in their new assessed value that they just received on that notice, and it will give them an estimate based off of the 2018 budgets. So it would be as if you received that tax bill last year with that new value, what you would have paid in taxes. We're gonna highly stress that that is an estimate because not everybody has gone through their budget process yet. And we won't know those total in tax impacts until we get to November of 2019, once the city council, the county board, the school board of Janesville and Beloit 
and also Blackhawk Tech complete their 2020 levies or their budget studies. So the parcel breakdown right now in the city of Janesville for 2019, I guess I shouldn't say right now because you guys are still living in 2018 of the data you can see. So the new parcel breakdown will be as follows. The residential class, the percent of parcels that residential represents is 90%, but they represent 72% of our total assessed value. Commercial properties represent 6%, but they represent 26% of our total value in the community. And then the other is just like agricultural or other types of different parcels. We have eight different classes, but the two main ones are residential and commercial. You can see on this slide the value breakdown of residential properties. We are still valuing our commercial properties at this time, so we don't have all of that data. But the breakdown here shows what each property was valued at as a total percentage to the city from 2011 to 2019. The biggest difference you'll see here or that I see when I look at these slides is that in 2011, we had 80% of our parcel base assessed at 150,000 or less. And now in 2019, we have 50% of the parcel base at 150,000 or less. So there definitely has been, you can see that increase in the numbers here too, with how the assessments break down by parcel throughout the city. Commercial values, as I stated, are still being finalized. However, the hospitality industry, so segments of that like hotels or restaurants, in those areas, plus multifamily and warehouse, will be sh they're showing that the values are increasing, while office and retail are seeing some decreases, not overall, but certain segments of those are seeing decreases. Offices continued to decline and struggle in Janesville since 2011. We're seeing that in the sales and with the income data we've received from property owners. And retail is just going through a state of transition where the smaller footprint stores, 10,000 or less, are more desirable than the bigger big boxes in the area. So our timeline for the project yet is here by the end of May. At the latest, by the beginning of June, we'll be sending out those notices of assessment change to every property owner in the city of Janesville. Once those are out, we will head into our open book process during June, and those, are by, those appointments that we have are by appointment only and scheduled through the assessor's office. Once that is done, then we head into a further appeal process called border review that's more formal, and that will be held in August sometime, and that's also by appointment only, but those are scheduled through the clerk treasurer's office. The dates, the specific dates and times will be provided in the notice of assessment change once those are released to the community. This is an example of a change notice and I apologize, it looks a little small. This is the top half of an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. It will show the property owner's address, the parcel number. Underneath in that big open white space, we are going to put in our notices, the average assessment change was blank so that you have that information right on the notice and when you're doing the math to find out your, average, your change, you can compare where you're at to the average. It will also contain the specific dates and times and location for open book and border review, and then also contain your 2018 assessment and now your new proposed 2019 assessment in that notice. Along with that notice of assessment change, we are sending a frequently asked question insert that has a ton of information on it. It is double-sided and has information if you're coming to open book of what we expect the property owners to provide for us. And other resources, the website will be continually updated in our revaluation section of the city's website. Once we have released those notices, we'll have a list of arm's length sales that we called valid in our office, and that's what we use to calibrate our system. We'll also have the estimated tax calculator. We'll have our neighborhood maps because our neighborhoods are bigger and broader than what the average citizen thinks their neighborhood is. We'll also have videos, so we have the assessment video that Mark showed not too long ago of what an assessor does and then we'll also have a link to the Park Place Views episode that I did 
in the beginning of the year or December of last year, sometime in that time frame, of more specific information of what a revaluation is and what to do if you don't agree with your new value. We'll also have links to the Department of Revenue's website, and those links will link to the Department of Revenue oversees what we do in our office, so they have more rules and guidelines and a property owner guide and things like that for community members to reference. So lots of tools and resources, not only about public events, as Mark stated, but definitely each home on the website has a lot of information. So in summary, revaluations are revenue neutral. They are not completed to increase the tax collection. They do not determine how much tax is needed. Revaluations are completed to proportionately distribute the total tax to be collected based on individual market values of each property. Thank you, and I'm available for questions. Questions for the city assessor? Council Member Markman. He's got a couple. Just, by Council Member just for people to be clear on this, when they get your assessment, that's not the city's determination of what their house will sell for? No, because yeah. we're seeing that the market is still increasing. So it, again, we do an estimate of value and depending on when that estimate is done, our estimates will be based off of the arm's length sales that occurred in 2018. So if our data is correct on the property, we should be in the ballpark of what it would sell for, but we're not gonna be the exact number they would sell for. Correct, I mean, that's a common misconception I've heard out in the, out in the community that they just told me my house is worth this. I don't think it is. I'm a, um, when you send out your frequently asked questions, will that show on there what the average percent change was across the city? No, since we're sending out 26,000 notices, those are being printed now beforehand, but the assessment, the actual notice that we'll be printing here shortly will contain that average assessment change. Okay, so they'll be able to look at that to determine yes. where, they, where they fit. Yep. Great, and then will this be effect for taxes? Will it go back to January 1st, 2019, or will it be effective January 1st, 2020? Nope, these assessments will go back to January 1st of 2019. Okay, so they will be on this year's tax bill. Correct. Okay, thank you. Council Member Farrell. Thank you. Uh, Michelle, one of the things I'm always interested in is who our top uh, commercial taxpayers are. Could you name just a few of those? We're not done with the commercial valuation okay. piece of the revalves yet. Okay. So for me to state what they were, I would be speculating maybe okay. off a year's past, so. Okay, that's fine. The other question I have, and I'm really curious about this, is the, the former GM site. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's also a specific question, but how do you anticipate that property being assessed? I mean, it seems like, well, when it gets developed, it will be assessed at a higher amount. Can you just give me a general idea how we would uh, approach uh, the assessment for that former GM site? So for 2019, we're not making many changes other than the cost table changes to that property. It will be one of the few commercial properties left on the cost approach versus the income approach. And we valued that property, it got shifted back to be locally assessed for 2018. And with that, we went through the process and reviewed that parcel. And we've already removed a lot of value from that, deeming that the buildings were hindering the further Con, or the further development or redevelopment of that parcel. So the value is more minimal or probably the lowest it's ever been on the property now. And then once those buildings are removed, which I'm expecting that to probably be fully done by the end of this year, I would say for sure, <coughs> then we will value that as vacant land at its new highest and best use as new redevelopment sites. Okay. So I would say now we're at the lowest value of that property and then as it gets redeveloped, it will continue to grow and get okay. higher. Great, thank you. Other questions, Council Member Conley. Um, have you seen the revaluations increase in every neighborhood in Janesville? No. Can you talk a little bit about why that might be? Uh, some of our condo neighborhoods haven't fully come back from the new regulations with lending that we've seen some of them, not all of them. I would say the majority of them have come back, but there's some 
some of the areas that have not fully come back yet that will not be seeing an increase. And other than that, I would say all areas of the city have seen increases in value. So even like the fourth ward and look west, are they going to see increases about the same average as the rest of the community then? Probably not fourth ward, but our other areas of the city, we're seeing that there's such a lack of supply of housing that each side of the city is acting more like the east side than it ever has in the past. Okay. So do we have a shortage in the fourth ward as well or no? I would say we have a shortage of housing everywhere, everywhere. in the city. So what, what about the fourth ward um, makes it not increase as the rest? Just the desirability factor. It hasn't fully been restored to what it originally was at one time. Okay. And how many houses do you actually look at? Every year in our office, we review all of the sales that happen within the city and we review all of the permits and all the new construction. Typically, that's between two to 3,000 properties that we request to visit, and we get into about 40% of those. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for the city assessor? I've got just one, and uh, I'm actually kind of reluctant to ask it because I'm not sure that there is a short answer to it, but there's multiple approaches to how you appraise a property. One is the cost approach, and the other uh, is, is an income approach. And what's the difference? And why is the difference such that you apply it in some instances in commercial properties and other instances you don't? Or is it, a is it provided consistently in using both methods and coming to a fair conclusion? So when you value properties, you want to value each like type in the same manner. So if you're valuing warehousing, you want to value all warehousing properties either on the cost, the income, or the sales approach. And we review all three to determine which one seems the most logical or reasonable. And that also de is dependent upon the income and expense response that we receive from the community. If we didn't receive a lot of income and expense information from commercial property owners, then we're kind of left to be guessing more at that than we would with other approaches. So each one is looked at individually to determine which method would be the best in that circumstance. Typically, an income approach would come in lower than a cost approach, just the nature of the valuation. So the lesson there is if I'm a commercial property owner, it's probably in my best interest, interest to report my income in order to ensure that I'm getting the most accurate appraisal is that, or assessment. Is that correct? Correct. That's true okay. for any class of property to either, one, let us in and respond to our request to view the property, or two, when we request income and expense information, to respond to that request. Thank you. Any other last questions? Thank you very much for the presentation. Brings us to old business, item number one, public hearing and action on a proposed resolution vacating a portion of Wall Street west of Academy Street, file resolution number 2019-1632, Dwayne Cherick. Uh, good evening, City Council, Dwayne Cherick, Planning Director for the City. The city has received a request from Matt Sigmund, owner of Centerway Auto Repair, to vacate a portion of West Wall Street. The parcel in question is located at the southwest corner of Centerway and North Academy Street and contains approximately 5,300 square feet in total land area. This street segment was originally dedicated by Subdivision Platt way back in 1854. However, when the state of Wisconsin constructed the extension of Highway 51 through Janesville in the uh, 1950s along the current uh, centerway corridor alignment, the Department of Transportation acquired this uh, local right-of-way for that project. West Wall Street has subsequently been uh, converted to a dead end or uh, stub street rather, following that project. At the uh, Department of Public Works request, the Department of Transportation recently deeded ownership 
of this existing street right of way back to the city of Janesville to allow for the proposed vacation to occur. <clears throat> the street was last resurfaced in 1983. As you can see from these photos, the existing street pavement and sidewalk condition uh, is in very poor condition. Access uh, along the street is limited to a single driveway that only serves centerway auto repair. Uh, the Department of Public Works has determined that this facility is no longer necessary for public street purposes and may be vacated. The, if the council approves the vacation this evening, ownership of the existing right of way would revert to the abutting property owner and business use. The petitioner in this case intends to utilize uh, the vacated right of way for additional parking and the establishment of additional green area along the uh, centerway corridor which is delineated on the, uh, the site plan that you can see on the monitor. Overall, the project would improve traffic safety by eliminating the Wall Street intersection at Academy, which is situated too close to the Highway 51 corridor. Resolution number 2019-1632 would also retain an easement for utility purposes over the vacated area to provide access uh, for future maintenance to public utilities that are already in place. The Plan Commission reviewed and approved the proposed vacation on April 15th, and this evening the City Council, or the City rather, recommends uh, Council adopt file resolution number 2019-1632 uh, following the required public hearing for this item. And with that, I would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Questions for Mr. Cherry? None. Let's open the public. Oh, go ahead. Let's move public the hearing. I didn't have one. Yep. Okay. Let's open the public hearing. Public hearing is open. Anyone wishing to speak to this item, which is the vacation of a portion of Wall Street west of Academy? That's first call. Second call. Third call. Public hearing is closed. Councilmember Wolf. I move approval of resolution 2019-1632. Second. Second by Council Member Williams. Questions or comments? No additional. I've been down to this property several times and yeah, it doesn't really make sense to have that anymore. And go back to the owner and I believe the owner has been taking care of some of that area already and <clears throat> just It'll look a lot better having more green space and, and they can get some additional parking. So it's a good thing. Thank you. Anyone else? Let's go ahead and vote. And the resolution is approved 7-0. Thank you. Uh, next item, item number two under old business is second reading, public hearing, and action on a proposed ordinance amending the end consumption time of fermented malt beverages and wine in conjunction with a beer and wine permit in certain areas of Traxler Park, Riverside Park, Palmer Park, the Town Square, and Festival Street during private events, file ordinance number 2019-753. Shelley Slapak. Thank you. Good evening, City Council. Shelley Slapak, Recreation Director. I am here to, tonight to present to you File Ordinance 2019-753, an amendment to Ordinance 12.60.127, extending the end consumption time of fermented malt beverages and wine in conjunction with a beer and wine permit in certain areas of Traxler Park, Palmer Park, Riverside Park, the Town Square, and Festival Street during private events. This ordinance is co-sponsored by Council President Gruber, Gruber and uh, City Council Member Farrell. In 2013, file ordinance 2013-530 was adopted by City Council that did establish a permit with a $50 fee allowing the possession and consumption of fermented malt beverages and wines at the designated areas and times in Traxler, Riverside, and Palmer Parks. The designated areas at Traxler Park are the Warming House and the Lions Pavilion, the Riverside Park area is the North and South Pavilions, and then the Palmer Park Hilltop Pavilion, and the 10-foot surrounding area around each of those pavilions. In February of this year, the City Council also adopted File Ordinance 2019-747, which expanded the permit to include the J.P. Cullen Pavilion and Festival Street at the Town Square. 
Currently, the ordinance 12.60.127 allows for possession and consumption of fermented malt beverages and wines in those areas with a beer and per wine permit for private events. The permit must be in conjunction with a pavilion rental or private event rental, and the permit must be approved administratively in the recreation division. The end time for consumption currently is 9 p.m. The proposed ordinance amendment would change the end consumption time for the permit from 9 p.m. to 11 p.m., except in the Palmer Park Hilltop area, which would remain 9 p.m., which is consistent with established park end hours. The PRAC voted in support of the city recommendation during uh, their April 9th <coughs> meeting, as well as the ALAC supported the city recommendation at their May 7th meeting. The police department has been informed and is also in support. The city recommends approval of file ordinance number 2019-753 after the public hearing, extending the end consumption time of fermented malt beverages and wine in conjunction with a beer and wine permit in certain areas of Traxler Park, Riverside Park, Palmer Park, the Town Square, and Festival Street during private events. With that, uh, I'll take any questions after the public hearing. Questions for Ms. Slapek. Councilmember Marklin. Just had one. If the um, private event has an ending time of, of earlier than 11, I would assume that the permit for the alcohol would end with the permit time? Correct. Okay. Yes, so it does not to have to go until 11 p.m. Thank you. And many do not. Other questions? Let's open the public hearing. The public hearing is open. Please go to the uh, podium. Your name and address, please. Uh, David Cress, 1816 Elizabeth Street. And I would like to speak in favor of this. In January, I uh, went and reserved Riverside Park Pavilion and paid the $50 fee. And after that, I found out that uh, Sportsman's Park was $25 and that their time was till the park closed at 10 o'clock. So I was kind of disappointed, but uh, I in favor of, of changing it and uh, as or well see what I wanted to mention yeah I th this event is for the 60th high school class reunion and did want to get a lot of the Janesville people back to Riverside Park one of the most beautiful parks in Janesville and so with this ordinance change uh, as the <clears throat> organizer of the event I don't have to worry about uh, people you know having half full beers at nine o'clock and having to finish them. So I would like to thank uh, Councilman Gruber and Farrell <clears throat> for uh, initiating this change. Thank you. thank you. Any other speakers? Second call. Third call for speakers. Hearing none, the public hearing is closed. What is the pleasure of the council? I'll make a motion to adopt file ordinance number 2019-753, amending the end consumption time of fermented malt beverages and wine in conjunction with a beer and wine permit. Second. Do we need to do a second reading? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, we do. Okay. Sorry. Now that it's on the floor, let's do a second reading. <laughs> file ordinance number 2019-753. An amendment to ordinance 12.60.127, extending the end time for consumption of fermented malt beverages and wines at certain areas of Traxler Park, Riverside Park, Palmer Park, the Town Square, and Festival Street. Thank you. We have a motion on the floor by Williams, second by Conley to approve. File additional comments or questions. Councilmember Wolf. Shelley, just clarify the Palmer Park. Hours. The uh, hilltop Park. portion will. Palmer Park would remain at 9 p.m. The entire park. Uh, just Palmer Park. Just so the only area within Palmer Park that you can get this permit is the with the Palmer Park Hilltop Pavilion. If you reserve the Palmer Park West Pavilion or the East Pavilion, you cannot get a beer or wine permit with those pavilions. Okay, so there'll be no inconsistency with this potential parking ordinance change. That the as to the hours, correct? Because they, you can't have you can't beer wine permits in the those lower, lower pavilions. It doesn't really clarify that in the resolution, but it's clarified now. Thank you. Other questions, comments? 
Seeing none, what's the what's all in oh, favor? Uh, just a, uh, thank you. I just have a quick comment. I think uh, this is a good uh, change that we're making. It makes sense to me that have the hours correspond with the closing of the parks. And um, uh, I remember when we, one of our committees, the uh, agreed to move forward with alcohol at uh, pavilions. I think it's worked out very well. I have not heard of any negatives, so I think this is a good step forward. And I think it's uh, good for our citizens to be able to utilize these pavilions in this manner. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Seeing none, uh, let's go ahead and vote. All in favor, raise your arm. And that motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Brings us to new business, item number one, consideration and action on a proposed resolution authorizing the issuance of 20.02 million in general obligation promissory notes for financing various public purposes and $3,020,000 in taxable general obligation promissory notes to provide financial assistance for community development. File resolution 2019-1656. Max Kagan. Thank you, Council President Gruber and City Council. Before you tonight is the City's 2019 capital improvement plan, as well as our note issuance, which is a means of funding that capital improvement plan. So before addressing the note issue first, I just want to provide the city council with some perspective on how we fund our capital improvement program. So this year's capital improvement plan is $44.4 million and uh, it's made up of three uh, general categories of funding sources, that being new debt at 52%, other funding sources at 37%, and prior year funding, whether it be borrowed funds, grant funds, and that comes in at 11%. But really, I think the thing of note here is that the amount of new debt to support our capital improvement program has actually been decreasing for the past couple years as we've been either successful in receiving grants or appropriating more money through the operating budget. So you're seeing the other funding sources category continue to grow uh, over time. So tonight, the City Council is asked to adopt file resolution number 2019-1656, which authorizes the city to issue promissory notes, uh, really for two purposes. First, uh, roughly $20 million for public purposes, and these are treated as non-taxable promissory notes, as well as $3 million to provide a financial assistance for community development, and these are considered a taxable private purpose and are being issued as a separate note. Um, for the Council's awareness, we could have considered awarding these as one issuance. However, that would have made the entirety of the issuance a taxable issuance because uh, the $3 million would have exceeded the threshold of 5% of your total issue that can be for private purposes. So it's more cost effective to do it as two separate issuances, one as a taxable and one as a non-taxable issuance. Uh, so the total amount of debt uh, under consideration tonight is $23 million with $10 million uh, attributed to the general fund and $13 million uh, for non-general fund, uh, mostly for our enterprise funds such as water and wastewater. Um, so far, the City Council is committed to fund $16.6 million, which is 72% of all new debt, and we do not have the opportunity to refinance uh, debt. It's not cost effective given where interest rates are currently today, as well as what the interest rates were when that debt was issued. So looking at the significant projects, really five categories make up about 86% of all the new debt uh, as part of this issuance. Uh, the first and largest category being street infrastructure at 7.2 million, uh, which would be roughly 9 million if we included the prior year funding. Uh, so prior note proceeds, uh, roughly $5 million for water, wastewater, and stormwater infrastructure. $3 million for a developer payment to Shine Medical te Technologies to build their medical isotope facility on the south side, $2.8 million for City Hall and Library improvements, and $2 million for the preliminary construction of the sanitary landfill expansion site. So about $20 million of the $23 million of new debt come into these five categories. 
Uh, looking specifically at our general fund, I mentioned we're issuing about $10 million. Uh, that would come to an average annual debt service payment of about $1,135,000 a year. Um, however, our projected debt service payment for the 2020 general fund budget would actually only increase about $30,000. Uh, and that's primarily due to the retirement of existing debt. So uh, we are retiring about $1.3 million in general fund debt uh, in 2020. So um, that's the reason why that increase is so small, uh, which is great, uh, as the council may be aware, the debt service payment in the general fund has increased roughly seven hundred dollars to $800,000 a year. Uh, and we've really reached a point where our uh, program is really plateaued that we can sustain borrowing about eight to ten million dollars a year and keep that debt service payment flat. So it's been a long time coming, but uh, I think we're at a very, a very good point in our general fund borrowing that we can maintain a consistent program and not have to worry about its significant increase in that debt service payment or therefore taxes for the average homeowner. Uh, so that does project out to about a 0.1% increase in the general funds portion of the property tax levy for next year, which for the average assessed home comes out to about 90 cents. I'm sorry, how much? 90 cents. 90 cents, thank you. Next, uh, one of the items we do look at is the city's debt burden. Uh, by Wisconsin state statute, uh, cities are limited in the amount of debt they can have outstanding uh, to 5% of their equalized value. As of the end of 2018, we had $97,195,000 in outstanding general obligation debt, which equated to about 2.11% of the city's equalized value. Uh, we did make a principal payment of roughly $18 million on February 1st of this year. Um, and then if we factor in the amount of this new issuance, what we're projecting for the end of 2019 is that we would have $102,260,000 in outstanding general obligation debt, which is increase of 5 million, 5.1 million. But actually as a percentage of our equalized value, it will be decreasing to 2.08%. And that's because our equalized value has grown at a faster rate than the amount of debt, that we're, new debt we're bringing on. So I think that kind of what we're seeing from Michelle's presentation as the city's equalized assessed value has really grown in those three years our capacity to issue debt to provide the services our community needs has increased as well. So council policy 75 uh, does govern debt and debt management. Uh, and within there, there are a couple of metrics that we try, we abide by. Um, so this year's note issuance does fall within the established parameters from council policy 75. Uh, so as I mentioned, our general obligation debts project to be about 2.08% of equalized value. Uh, the city council does limit it to 2.5%. So we'll be under that threshold, as well as our general debt service payment is projected to be about 18.9% of all the general fund expenditures in our 2020 budget, uh, which falls under the city council limit of 20%. Next, just want to provide the council with a little bit of perspective on last year's note issuance as well as uh, the past five years uh, average for our issuances. So last year uh, in 2018, we issued about $22 million uh, worth of debt, uh, all for new borrowing, about $8 million in the general fund and about $14 million for the other funds. Looking at a five-year average, uh, we've averaged about $21 million in issuances, new debt being about $18 million, and refunded debt about two and a half. So uh, this size debt at about $23 million, a little bit above where we've been last year, as well as our five-year average. But again, uh, a lot of it has to do with uh, a couple of large one-time items. Next, I'll talk a little bit about the process. So tonight, the city council is asked to adopt what is called the initial resolution, uh, which sets the parameters for the sale. Uh, so at this time, the city council has the option to either add and or delete projects and or funding from the program before its adoption. Uh, at the next council meeting on May 28th, the city council can either approve the capital improvement program and note issue as is or delete projects. So 
no new funding can be added at the next city council meeting. And then lastly, our sale is occurring on Monday, June 24th at 10 a.m. Uh, and then later that night, the city council will award the sale of the promissory notes to the lowest bidder, establish interest rates, and agree to levy taxes thereafter <coughs> to cover debt service payments. So as part of your material, there was three exhibits. Uh, first is the proposed 2019 capital improvement plan, uh, and that's a schedule by funding source. Uh, if you look on there, there's some items highlighted in green. Those are the ones that the city council has previously committed to fund through prior actions, such as the award of a public works contract. Exhibit two is a detailed description of all of the 2019 capital improvement plan projects. And exhibit three is a copy of council policy 75 on debt management. So with that, I would ask the city council to adopt file resolution 2019-1656 to issue 20 million, 20,000 in general obligation promissory notes for financing various public purposes and 3,020,000 in taxable general obligation promissory notes to provide financial assistance for community development. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Council Member Wolf. Max, uh, the developer incentive of $3,020,000, that's earmarked for the Shine development within TIF 35. Correct. Is it fair to say that the repayment of that borrowing within TIF 35 comes from the increased taxes that are paid on that parcel as a result of the end value of Shine's project, which I think we've estimated at $50 million of assessed value. Is that a yes, fair statement? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Other questions for Mr. Gagan? Council Member Farrell. Um, Max, um, I didn't do a detailed uh, comparison, but are the list of all the um, items on here is this pretty much it's the same as what we uh looked at for our annual budget correct uh, have so, there been my question is there been any any uh significant additions from when we looked at this like october uh so as part of our 2019 budget there is we include the major capital projects budget Right, And I would have to say that most of the projects that are listed within that major capital projects are found on this sheet. Okay. However, uh, some of the cost estimates we had at that time are not as accurate as what we had today because we've awarded some contracts. So some of the dollar amounts have changed. Um, okay. But I'm not aware of any significant projects okay. that have been added since okay. then. Uh, and if they had, they would okay. have gone through uh, and been awarded through like a public works contract that the city okay. council has already seen. So. Okay, thank you. Other questions for Mr. Kagan? Seeing no, oops, Council Member Wolf. File move, file resolution 2019-1686. That is in order. Thank Council you. Member Wolf has moved approval. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. Seconded by Council Member Conley. Further discussion? Council Member Wolf? No. Conley? Nope. Hearing none, all in favor, raise your right hand. That motion carries unanimously. Thank you, Max. All right, thank you. Uh, next item is a first reading and schedule a public hearing on a proposed ordinance amending Chapter 18 zoning and Chapter 8 health and safety of the Code of General Ordinances to create a section regulating fences. File ordinance number 2019-748. Ordinance number 2019-748, an ordinance repealing JGO chapter 8.12, amending various portions of chapter 18.32 and creating JGO section 18.32.035 to establish new fence regulations with penalties and other relief for violations thereof as set forth in JGO Chapter 18.28. Thank you. We'll refer that to the Plan Commission and schedule a public hearing for June 24th of 2019. Next item is item number three, first reading and schedule a public hearing 
on a proposed revision to Janesville General Ordinance 10-36-050, authorizing sleeping in parked vehicles in designated public parking areas between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m. when posted file ordinance number 2019-755. File Ordinance Number 2019-755, an ordinance to amend Chapter 10, Vehicles and Traffic, pertaining to overnight public parking in the City of Janesville, with penalties as set forth in JGO 10.36.060. Thank you. I'm going to uh, schedule the public hearing after this matter has been referred and uh, reviewed by the Parks and Recreation Advisory Committee, the Police Department, and the Fire Department. And that would mean that the earliest we could have a second hearing and um, public hearing would be July 22nd. So hearing no objections, so ordered. Let's go to the next item, item number... Mark, yeah. Mark. Just a comment, the police department was already part of this I, conversation. I'm requesting formally a second time. A second review. Formal, yes. I don't understand formal. In writing, review. thank you. In writing? Yeah, yeah. thank okay. you. The next item... Common Council announcements. Seeing none, the uh, item there after is consideration or one or more motions to convene into closed session. Pursuant to uh, Wisconsin statute 19-85 uh, sub 1 sub C for the purposes as outlined on the agenda packet. So motion. Moved. motion by Williams. Second. Second by Conley. Anything additional? Let's vote. All in favor? Motion carries unanimously. 